This is actually the lecture for chapter two, um, the primary elements. And this is when it starts really getting fun. If you, if you think about it and have some answers that make sense to me, it doesn't have to have been in the book. I mean, this is such a subjective class. It's not like math where two plus two is no. four all the time. This is art and this is supposed to be, you know, interesting. Um, I don't know if you've had a chance to look at the vocabulary words in the glossary. Um, so if you ever you come across something and it doesn't make sense to you, look in the back, look up the word, if you, you know, to presume you, you know what all the words are. Um, this chapter is talking about the vocabulary of art, um, the language of art. They're dividing it into, into five, five different categories of the primal, primary elements. One is, is um, space, and that's the fold of action, whatever fold means. But we, you know, this piece of paper is two-dimensional, unless you get technical with physicists that it does actually take a depth. But for our purposes, it's a flat sheet of paper, um, and it's two-dimensional. It's height and, and width, but not depth. The so three-dimensional is the space we take, and we're three-dimensional. And now that they have 3D printers, obviously we've got a whole area of art that's brand new to like what last year, the last couple of years. When did they start with 3D printers? Um, at least I've never heard of them before a couple of years ago. Now you can, you know, there's artists popping in designs and coming up with 3D uh, models. Uh, if you've got a lot of money or access to one of those really expensive 3D printers. With art, if we're using a two dimensional surface with painting or drawing or printing, we're trying to create the sense of depth and space without it having their, their in reality. So we're creating an illusion of depth with 3D. Uh, sculpture and architecture, obviously those take up the third space of depth. So one of the challenges an artist has is to define and control the space. And they want your eye to move through the space of the drawing or the painting, and they control that with the next area, line. We're going to work with lines, uh, starting with the next chapter, with drawing. And we're going to talk about thick and thin and rough and repetition and pattern with line. And we're going to have some fun with that hands-on. Um, but from this, this illustration on um, page 35 of the book of Vincent van Gogh, uh, he was a, was a 19th century late 19th century artist. Do you, you guys probably saw movies about Vincent van Gogh. He's the one that, he probably was bipolar and he had a, you know, emotional breakdown and cut, cut part of his ear off and then did a self-portrait of himself. Um, so he had um, deep emotional issues and his story is fascinating to me. He's one of the most interesting artists to me historically and I love his work. Uh, when you see his work, the power and the movement of the lines and the way he puts color on thick and thin and moves your eye through the space. And you can see in this particular drawing on page 35, he could take the same utensil and create texture of, of the fields and the flowers and the clouds and the trees and the trunks and the buildings. With such vir virtuosity, he's um, a genius in, in, in his structure of line and he creates depth and he creates pattern and he creates beauty and repetition and that is he's a particular genius I, I think he's amazing so we're gonna we're gonna get to do more about lines um, hands-on okay we'll start doing some hands-on stuff all right so then the third area is shape and um, the difference between shape and space I think is Space, you're really trying to create the depth, whereas with shape, you can create shape without depth. Does that make sense? Um, Jean Arp, he's French, uh, French German artist, 20th century, early 20th century. Look him up, Google him, look at some of his shapes. Alexander Calder, uh, Ellsworth Kelly, Constantine Brancusi, and Henry Moore. Alexander Calder is one of my favorite sculptors. And he did uh, a lot with lines and, and shapes and his mobiles. It, you know, look at these artists on Google or whatever, Chrome, whatever, and, and go for the images. Alexander Calder, he was born in Russia, but he spent most of his time in Paris and then in America. He 
made an art out of making mobiles, and sometimes they're humongous. They're in they're in squares in uh, big cities up north um, that are hanging from the ceiling. If you go to a museum, usually organic shapes. And when we talk about organic shapes, they're usually very round and and soft edges. Uh, same with John Arp and. Henry Moore and Brancusi, these artists, and Ellsworth Kelly, they use a lot of organic round shapes. Um, there are some other artists who use more head, hard edge shapes, more, more squares and, or, or circles, and their edges are more um, rigid and have geometrics. So when you see, when you see more boxes and squares, uh, you're talking about order and reason and unity and coherence. There's something about geometric shapes that seem that, that feel like math, you know, that feel that feel like order. And it's for some people that that's very peaceful and calm. Um, whereas the more organic shapes have the uneven curves um, and they have they progress more unevenly. So you don't know how it's going to turn next and they kind of look like amoebas if you've ever done biology class. Um, they can be abstracted shapes that um, can be recognizable, but they're distorted, or they're non-representational. They're non-objective, they're soft, organic, or hard-edged. A lot of Henry Moore, the last artist, he's a British artist that did, ended up doing sculptures. They kind of look like people, but they're just very broken down to their just rounded forms, you know? So sometimes they're more obviously human, and sometimes they're like, is that a cow or a you know, or, you know, can't really tell what it is, but he did a lot of people very, um, almost non-representational or, or abstracted for sure. So shape um, is what we're going to work on in class next week. We're going to use, you know, just like in kindergarten when you just cut out colors and shapes and laid them on each other. So if you look at some of these artists, and Ellsworth Kelly, who's, who's in chapter three. If shape, I want you to know then those four basic things, geometric, organic, abstract, and non-representational. It comes in 2D, and what is 2D? 2D is height, and with 3D adds depth. So when you're looking at a piece of artwork, you can look at it from a sense of the shapes and how a lot of critics of art will talk about a repetition of the shape. Some artists work in triangulars. A lot of the work, you know, I talked about um, uh, and I showed you a picture of Michelangelo's Pieta. It's in the it's in the book, and how Mary's head and Jesus laying in her lap. It's a very triangular shape of the sculpture, and and that again feels calming because it's geometric in its basic form. Um, a lot of people you'll see repetitions of circles. They'll have their work. They'll have circles or or ovals. They'll they'll repeat a shape in their work, and we may not be conscious of it when we look at it, but it'll it'll give us a sense of of organization, a, a, fe a feeling of unity when we see, you know, something that has a repetition of shape. Um, so shape is one of the basic elements of, 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 um, of art. Okay, then um, number four, light and shadow, uh, or value. Um, that's when an artist really works at creating the sense of depth. You don't really have any reason for it if you're just trying to keep a two-dimensional space. And some of these artists I'm describing, like Ellsworth Kelly, they're just shapes. There's no depth. There's no sense of light and shadow other than a lighter color, a darker color. You know, black and white, obviously, we're going to read the black is dark and the white is light. Or, you know, we're going to do that color can recede and move forward based on its intensity and its values. But light and shadow, we're talking about creating depth very specifically. Page 41, you can see an example of uh, an artist, George Seurat, he was a, a French Impressionist, uh, late 1800s, he lived into the 20th century too. He, he used very small, fine points to create shadow. The more, the more dots he put there, the, the more shading. And he, that's with a Connie crayon, it's a crayon, we'll use some Connie crayons. Anyway, he's, he's creating depth through, through an intensity of the lines where it's, where it's shadowed and less lines where it's not shadowed. So this is, this is one of the skills that artists build when they're creating um, a vocabulary of, of skill and, and technique of their own. They want to know how to, how to, how to build up uh, sh uh, sh uh, shadows with types of, of uh, marks. Um, Leonardo da Vinci was famous, and Michelangelo, a lot of these guys, they use crosshatch. Or you'll see that in the chapter on um, 
printmaking where, where you have lines going one way and lines going the other way and crossing. And where there's more of those cross hatches, it's darker. When there's less of them, it's lighter. So there's different ways to create value or light and shadow. Um, but it does give um, a sense of shape and depth to your artwork. 